Dr. Hobson's um, book is on back order. So if you please fill out this um, form so he can have your information so he can notify you when the book is coming back out. And just a little back um, drop on the new book club. We're going to be reading Dr. Hobson's um, book, The Legend of the Black Mecca, and we invite everyone to come back on April the 25th at 7 o'clock to discuss the book. Thank you and welcome. And Dr. Hobson, I'm from Birmingham. He's from Selma. And I am just happy to stand on the shoulders and introduce him. Thank you. Roll time. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, historically, uh, in in Atlanta, it's okay to say roll tide until this past year. Uh, so shout out to the Georgia Bulldogs; they looked okay. But there's a saying where I'm from that you never bet against the tide. So I'm just just letting that be known. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight uh, to be a part of the kickoff for. Uh, the new uh, Sweet Auburn Reads Book Club. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I, I want to say something about being here at Auburn Avenue Research Library. I've had a long-standing relationship with Auburn Avenue. Um, while a dissertation student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I did uh, most of my primary source re research here, here in, at Emory. And um, I developed such a relationship that when I was fortunate enough to come to Atlanta, uh, to, to become a professor at Georgia State, that Auburn Avenue offered me somewhat of, a, of an office away from my office because for some reason or not, I'm a popular professor on campus. And I could not get work done. Um, in 2014, my wife and I uh, had a baby. And my son was born at 28 weeks. He was one pound, 10 ounces. He's, he's good now. He is a three-nager and active. Um, but the staff here at Auburn Avenue Library worked wonders to make sure that I had all of my primary sources, they scanned documents. And so this is home for me. Uh, my, my late father used to always say, if you can't go home, you can't go nowhere. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Now, I want to take some time to kind of introduce what it is that I'm going to discuss tonight. And I, I ask that you all bear with me. Um, this new book is titled The Legend of the Black Mecca, and I want to tell you all something about why I chose the title. Um, I played college football, and I used to hang out with the football with the two rowdiest groups on campus, the football team and the members of Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. And there's something that, is, that runs between the groups is after years of you know, playing sports or hanging out in college, when you come back for homecoming, you tell really, really big lies. So, you know, we, we talk about, you know, when we played LSU and, and I jumped over 17 people on the football field and whatever, whatnot, and everyone knows there's only 11 people on the football field. And so the thing was, there's some truth to the story, but at some point in time, the story gets embellished. So this particular book, the reason it is called The Legend of the Black Mecca, is for every legend, there is truth. The idea is to dictate what this is. Now, I want to share this with you all, too. This is a 17-year-old Maurice Hobson uh, in Selma, Alabama. And this is my best friend's car, a 77 Cutlass that had an 8-track player in it. And because uh, we didn't have a cassette tape player, we would ride around Selma, Alabama, hometown, listening to Outkast. And so everything that you're about to see started as me listening to Outkast and Goody Mob and becoming a fan. If you pay attention to this picture, this is a primary source. And in this primary source, you will see a time uh, stamp on the bottom right hand of these pictures. That is March 5th, 1995. That was my senior year of high school. And Outkast comes to Selma during the Bridge Crossing Jubilee to do a concert. And I get a chance to meet them and tell them how much, you know, how big of a fan I am. And there's a story that goes behind that but I won't get into that just yet. But what happens with this is I went on to college where I played college football. I double majored in history and African-American studies. And I, uh, in 1996, in order to pay my initiation fee into Omega Sci-Fi, 
I came to Atlanta to work for Coca-Cola during the Olympics. My job was to uh, fill up ice barrels and make sure that, you know, pop would be on the, the different uh, wooden flats and everything and whatever, whatnot. But what happens in this, in this is that I was always enamored with the development of Atlanta versus Birmingham or Selma and enjoy the opportunity to see Muhammad Ali light the torch. I saw that with my own eyes. I saw Michael Johnson run the race with the gold shoes. And I was, I was, it was absolutely amazing. And when I was about five years old, I was at it. My father was offered a job at the Atlanta University, at Atlanta University uh, to train all PhDs in biology. And we were in a restaurant and this really large, loud man walks into the restaurant by the name of Maynard Jackson. And my parents acted as if Jesus Christ had walked into the room. Oh, my God, it's Maynard Jackson. And so I'm sharing this with you all because this sets the stage. And upon me going to do the Ph.D. at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, I married my interest in Outcast and Goody Mob, a conversation around the Olympics, this idea of civil rights historiography, and a, a conversation around historically black colleges and the Olympics, and I wrote a dissertation titled The Dawning of the Black New South, and what that did was it morphed into a bigger study. So without further ado, I want to read something to you all. First and foremost, I, I need to uh, pay homage to the ancestors. Uh, this book is dedicated to my father, the champion, and for my son, William the warrior, and to all of the ancestors that tarried, Ashe. On September 18, 1990, the International Olympic Committee selected Atlanta, Georgia as the host city for the Centennial Olympiad. A product of visionary leadership of black mayors Maynard Jackson and Andrew Young, this achievement signaled a Kairos moment for a southern city that only 25 years before had reeled in urban rebellion where poor black Atlantans took to the streets to air out grievances over police brutality and poor living conditions. Nearly two decades had passed since Maynard Jackson had ascended to the mayor's office, thanks to an unprecedented coalition of black Atlantans and the city's white progressive voters. And in winning the right to host the Olympics, Atlanta had scored a tremendous public relation victory. The city's boosters now flashed the hot Atlanta nickname, marketed by the Atlanta Convention Bureau and different trade and tourist administrations to lay claim that Atlanta had outgrown its status as regional capital, capital of the South transcending the region and history. After a massive reinvention, it had arrived as the Deep South's newest and most modern international city. Yet the fruits of this success were not and have never been shared equal. Poor blacks had benefited little from the events of the previous two decade, decades. Atlanta's poor and working class had reaped few material rewards from the recreation of Atlanta leading up to the Centennial Olympics. As black and white political and business elites polished and perfected Atlanta's new image for world consumption, they remained trapped by poverty and neglect. A divide between the black elite and the black poor had always riven Atlanta's social fabric and now became insuperable as the black city government pursued policies that seemed to benefit the black elites to the exclusion of the vast major majority of black citizens that had brought them to power. This multimedia presentation examines these contradictions as they emerged and deepened over the course of Atlanta's 20th century history in this period. Through archival research, oral histories, and music analysis, I would demonstrate how elected and appointed black political kingmakers capitalized and were supported by the broader black electorate to rise to power only to play politics and take the attention away from the black rake and file in Atlanta towards a new political machine. The contradiction of a relatively small black elite writing off the needs of the history of the large portions of black Atlanta altogether represent an ongoing effect seen as a result of the Centennial Olympic, Olympia. In this manuscript, I acknowledge that Atlanta represents the highest achievements of black folk in the country for more than a century, yet complicate the black mecha trope by cultivating counter black histories from Atlanta's underbelly as the city rose to world-class fame and fortune and bring the story far closer to the present by tapping unheard voices deep within Atlanta's marginalized community. Now, with that being said, I present to you all Dr. William Edward Burgart Du Bois. And 
Uh, du Bois moves to Atlanta in 1897 to teach at Atlanta University. He created a center that would study the life of black folk. It was the first of its kind. Atlanta was a unique city uh, during this, this time because it was, it's one of the first places where public housing was, was, uh, was presented. And I write this, that is not a typo, so Adelante, that is, that is how it is spelled. But it makes me think of the book, The Souls of Black Folk, where in this book, W.E.B. Du Bois writes, and he talks about Atlanta, how Atlanta bustles and rises out of the ash of William Tecumseh Sherman's burning of the city. And what he writes is, such are not men of sturdier make. They of Atlanta turn resolutely toward the future, and that future held aloft vistas of purple and gold. Atlanta, queen of the cotton kingdom. Atlanta, gateway to the land of the sun. Atlanta, the new lake of seas, meaning the measurement of success. So the city crowned her hundred hills with factories and stored her shops with cunning handiwork, with cunning handiwork and stretched long iron ways to greet the busy, the busy mercury in his coming, and the nation talked of her striving. What Du Bois lays out is that Atlanta is right to be taken. It is a, it's a particular place where black folk could actually thrive. This particular venue where we are today on the corner of Auburn and Cortland is hallowed ground. This is a conversation that we must have, particularly when William Tecumseh Sherman um, burns down the city. He brings federal troops here, and so there's equal protection and due process under the law for black folk before the 14th Amendment. So this is hallowed ground. But then Du Bois begins to think. And he says, but what will it take for the black community to sustain itself? And so he compares the city of Atlanta to a Greek goddess by the name of Adelante, who would only marry a man that could beat her in a foot race. Men would come from throughout the countryside to ask for her hand in marriage. They would race, she would beat them, and they would be put to death. But there's one suitor by the name of Hippomenes who really wants to marry Adelante. And so he goes to an old scribe on an ark, and the ark says, well, why don't you lay three golden apples along the course of the race, and you'll distract Adelante. So I would imagine that as they set the course to race, I don't know what these youngsters do today, but when I was a kid, they would say, you know, get ready, get set, go, and the person who would take off the shoes in the street usually would dust everybody. But I would believe that they got to the starting line, and someone said, get ready, get set, go, and this is what Du Bois writes. She fled like a shadow paused, started over the first apple, but even as he stretched his hand, fled again, hovered over the second, then slipping from his hot grasp, flew over the river, vale, and hill. But as she lingered over the third, his arms fell around her, and looking on each other, the blazing passion of their love profaned the sanctuary of love, and they were cursed. And then this is what Du Bois says. If Atlanta, Georgia, be not named for Adelante, it ought to have been because it's a city that has a tendency to get caught up with greed and mammon and not morality. And so this is a point of departure. Now, to set some things straight, and I, I must do this uh, for you guys uh, to, 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 to really clarify some things. Um, I have to set some things straight. Uh, there are some people in here who are historians and political scientists and, and economists, and if you come for me, I'm going to teach you how to do it. As a historian, we have to grapple with things such as historiography. And I want to share with you all what that means. So in writing history, you don't write history just to write it. What you're doing is you're fitting it within a larger canon of literature. This particular kind of uh, history champions the historiographies of the history of black education, the history of the black freedom struggle, and I'll get into that a little bit later, histories of the New South, the new African-American urban history, African-American cultural resistance, and African-American class formation and stratification. The theoretical frameworks used in this are theoretical frameworks such as racial uplift, and I'm going to give you all an understanding of that in, in just a second, urban regime theory, political economy, neoliberalism, and the culture of poverty theory. So this is, this is not just, you know, opinionated, you know, navel-gazing history. This is steeped in within something. I want to give you all a concept of racial uplift theory. Racial uplift comes about uh, during the same time as the American Negro Academy, where there was a serious conversation about, uh, around pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. And it's a noble gesture, but oftentimes it was placated as an ethos of self-help where black morality and material gain would distance the black upper and middle class from the black working class and poor and prove to white America that they were not savages. 
But the truth of the matter is that white supremacy is always going to see you as savages. And so it makes a very complicated kind of peace. And so with this, I want to kind of lay out some historical markers here. Of course, in 1864, Atlanta was captured and burned by William Tecumseh Sherman. I often joke my students, and uh, so don't hate me for this, but I'm a Saints fan. Um, I'm a Saints fan because of where I'm from. Uh, my first football games I went to were Saints games. My family's from the Gulf Coast. Um, I have nothing against the Falcons. But I often talk to my students and I say, when it's third and 10 and the Falcons are playing and they say, rise up, that has everything to do with Civil War memory. They were like, well, I never thought about it like that. So that's what it is. Between 1865 and 1883 or 1886, you have the founding of six historically black colleges. In 1895, Booker T. Washington gave a speech at the Cotton States and International Exhibition uh, that was that later becomes the language for codification. This language, Booker T. Washington's language becomes the language that creates separate but equal. The, the, the Supreme Court actually takes his words. In 1886, uh, you have the, the, the term, the New South, that is coined by Henry Grady, who's the managing editor at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. 1906, the city was marred by a race riot, which was the most violent race riot of all. 1924, Booker T. Washington High School is established. This is the first public high school in the city. Today, they still have a very storied, uh, the, the lore of their alumni uh, is something spectacular. 1928, just down the street, just several doors down, uh, you have uh, the Atlanta Daily World, the, the, a black newspaper that was founded, the first daily newspaper. 1946, and this is a very important part, John Wesley Dobbs and A.T. Walden create the Atlanta Negro Voters League. We'll talk about that a little bit later. 1948, Atlanta hires black police officers, but they could not uh, arrest white people. This is a very important piece. 1956, the William, uh, Bill Hartsville administration coins the term the city too busy to hate. And what the city too busy to hate actually means is that we're not Little Rock, Selma, Birmingham, Montgomery, the rest of the southern cities. And so we have to do some diving into that. 1961, the public schools integrate, whereas in the rest of the American South, the schools integrate 1970 or 1971. 1965, Q.V. Williamson is elected as an alderman. In 1966, you have the Summer Hill Rebellion. And I use rebellion for a reason. 67, you have the Dixie Hill Rebellion. And in 1968, you have the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. What goes from this is it sets the stage for a particular kind of conversation. This is Maynard Holbrook Jackson Jr. Now, I, I often like to say this, um, much of what I got for my book in terms of pictures of Maynard Jackson, I did not get from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. The family gave me the pictures. Um, they, they, were, they worked with me very well on this. This is a primary source or a pamphlet of when Maynard Jackson decides to run for the US Senate. And what is interesting about this is Maynard Jackson was a fifth generation Georgian uh, his grandfather, his paternal grandfather, founded Wheat Street Baptist Church. His maternal grandfather um, was John Wesley Dobbs, deemed the unofficial mayor of the Sweet Auburn District, highest ranking Mason, black Mason in all of Georgia, sat on the Morehouse Board of Trustees. He had six daughters. All of them went to Spelman College. All of them earned master's degrees. Maynard Jackson's mother, Irene Dobbs Jackson, received a PhD in French from the University of Toulouse. And so education was extremely stressed in the family. Um, the thing of it is Maynard's father uh, served as pastor of Friendship Baptist Church, and he also worked uh, on campus at uh, Morehouse College. But what becomes interesting in this is Maynard Jackson graduated from Morehouse at age 18. And he goes to Boston to go to law school and doesn't work out, and so he goes back down to Durham to North Carolina Central College, who's North Carolina Central College at the time. Uh, to do his law degree, and he, 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 he really flourishes there. His mother's a professor there, so he flourishes there. He meets um, his, his first wife, uh, Bunny um, Hayes, who becomes Bunny Hayes Jackson. And in 1968, they have a daughter by the name of Brooke. Bunny is from Lewisburg, North Carolina. So they're on a trip to North Carolina to show the baby off to Bunny's parents. Maynard comes back to Atlanta to tell a political committee that he's not going to run for any county position. King has just been assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy is killed. And Maynard Jackson decides that he has to do something. So he decides to borrow money 
from Leela Harris Ogden and qualify on the last day to run for the U.S. Senate against the most notorious white supremacist family in the South, the Talmadge family. He does this without talking to the black kingmakers in the city within the organization, the Atlanta Negro Voters League, which brokered the black political uh, clout here. And so his deciding to run without talking to the black kingmakers annoyed them. He runs, he gets beaten, but he carries Atlanta, which means that he can carry votes. In 1969, he decides that he's going to run for vice mayor, and he wins. And it becomes very evident as vice mayor that he was going to be a thorn in the side of the first Jewish mayor in the city, Sam Massell. In 1973, at the age of 35, Maynard Jackson becomes the first black mayor of the city. Now, he did all of these political campaigns, and not only did he not ask the black kingmakers in the city, he forgot to ask his wife. And one of the things that she would talk about is she says, I used to ask him, why are you doing this, man? And I didn't ask for any of this and whatever, what not. And so what I'm saying is that uh, uh, they, their, their marriage eventually unraveled. So if you decide to run for politics, I suggest you go and talk to your significant other before you jump out there. All right. But this is a picture of Maynard when he's running for the Senate. This is a picture of him the day that he is elected as mayor. Uh, this is actual footage. So, so that's uh, Bunny Jackson, now Bunny Jackson Ransom. That's Jesse Jackson in the background. And this was a major uh, step for Atlanta because the idea of Atlanta as a black mecca at that time is based on three things. The first is black education, the historically black colleges, which parlay and bled over into this conversation around black economics. The Sweet Auburn District, the, black thor the business thoroughfare, and the West Hunter Street District, which is now Martin Luther King Drive Southwest. And the last of that leg was black political empowerment and electoral politics, and Maynard exemplifies that. Maynard Jackson does a lot uh, in the city. There are five things that made him unquestionably loved by the black community. The first was his affirmative action policy. When Maynard Jackson became mayor in 1973, the city, black, black um, entrepreneurs received 1% of all city contracts. Less than 1%, I'm sorry about that. Point, that that's exactly right. Sue Ross, uh, Sue Ross has been around a long time taking pictures. Now, I ain't talking about you, Sue. By the time he left, it was up to 35%. Maynard Jackson created a lot of black millionaires. What this means is that every black slickster in the black world began to ascend on Atlanta. Because there was this idea that if you, you can go to Atlanta and get rich. And there's another conversation that we're going to discuss in just a second. The second thing was the expansion of MARTA and the expansion of the airport, which also was contracts. That, that was an opportunity for contracts. The, third, the fourth thing was police brutality. There was an issue with police brutality. And Maynard basically said, if you get caught doing something to a citizen, I'm going to prosecute you myself. Shows you that the police aren't that smart because the mayor can't prosecute um, police officers, but hey, he had to, he put the fear of God in him and, and, and so forth and so, uh, so on. But the fifth thing is the creation of the neighborhood planning units to where he allowed for black neighborhoods around the city to have some input if urban renewal and gentrification came about. There were two areas, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, to where Maynard Jackson became questionable. The first was the firing of the sanitation workers. As vice mayor, he, he marched with them and supported them. As mayor, he fired them. And there's a story, I can't prove it, uh, but it sounds about right, that he fires them at the end of the day and he asks all of the sanitation workers to walk into a room at 501 and then he says, I'm going to give you your jobs back, but they were trying to really kind of push me around and I couldn't let that happen. And it is, uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is what is widely believed as the mishandling of the Atlanta child murders. We'll get into that a little bit later. But what this does is this idea of contracts makes Atlanta the most inclusive city in the United States. And this is a part of a new point of departure that I've termed as the Black New South. And I want to read this to you all so you can get an understanding of what this is. The Black New South focuses on the experiences of black folk in a post-civil rights South. And it challenges the tensions and trends that have often been overlooked by scholars studying black life and analyzes and explicates national and international implications centered on history. 
urban and rural popular culture, education, electoral politics, land ownership, health disparity, sociology, psychology, religion, spirituality, and business. This is the thing. Atlanta touts itself as the cradle of the civil rights movement. But if you actually study historiography, that's disrespectful. Because King is not the only leader of the civil rights movement. You have several leaders that no one knows. And the, the issue with that is that leaders are oftentimes groundswell. So we're talking about organizers who are on the ground. People here in Atlanta, Dorothy Bolden, uh, Dorothy Cotton, Joanne Robinson, E.D. Nixon. And what's particularly interesting about what's going on in the American South at the time is that each particular episode of the civil rights movement was predicated by what the political economy was in those different places, as well as issues going on in the Caribbean, going on in Africa, and in, uh, in Asia. And so we have several conversations that take place. And the way in which we measure this conversation around being a civil rights spot or a civil rights battleground is the legislation that comes out of it. Let's take some time to think about this. In 1962, Dr. King and his crew decided they're going to go to Albany, Georgia. They felt that, like they had the, the right kind of storm to really get some reaction. But what they did not predict is that the sheriff, Lori Pritchett, had read everything that Dr. King had ever written, and he knew what the play was. One of the things you learn in sports is that if you study your opponent, you know what their tendencies are. And so what Pritchett does is he tells his policemen, don't beat them, don't do anything to them, just allow for them to exist, make sure you feed them and take care of them, and whatever, whatnot. The, the protesters did not get the kind of uh, reaction that they expected, and so the Albany movement failed. And so what King and his crew have to do is they have to find a place where they can find a big enough fool to do something stupid on camera. And Birmingham becomes that place. So what happens is, Around Easter, if you know anything about black folk and Easter, uh, that is a, that's a, a, a period of pageantry and pomp and circumstance. Uh, you see all kind of colors that you see no other time of year amongst uh, black folk. And there was an issue at a department store, Woolworth, where black folk could not buy clothes. And so King shows up there to tackle that issue, but he knew of Eugene Bull Connor. So when he gets there, he is put into jail, and he writes a letter from the Birmingham jail. But what happens is when he gets out, they organize a march, and the children begin to march in the street. What comes from this are the fire hoses and, and, and the police brutality and the dogs and all of those different kinds of, kinds of things. At the time, the United States is steeped in Cold War politics. They're trying to suggest you know, there's you know, liberty and justice for all. Cameras are rolling. And when we begin to talk about this, so, uh, after that particular campaign, four little girls are killed by a bomb from the Klan in a church. What this forces then President Lyndon B. Johnson to do, the newly minted President Lyndon B. Johnson to do after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, is for Lyndon B. Johnson to write an executive order, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which buttresses the 14th Amendment and grants equal prote protection and due process under the law, i.e. citizenship. So when you talk about citizenship, Birmingham is ground zero. The second of these comes out of my hometown in Alabama, Selma. You all know the story. You've watched the movie. Um, Jimmy Lee Jackson was you know, trying to protect an elder, uh, an elder from being beaten by the police because black folk were trying to vote. They were peacefully assembling. The police hunt him down, shoot him. The crowd decides that they're going to march his body from Selma to Montgomery and drop it on the, the steps of the Alabama State Capitol. They don't do that, but they do it in effigy. And when they cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the state police, paid for by black folk state dollars, their taxes, exact harm and violence on them. The world is watching. It was a black eye in, Cold War, uh, in, in terms of the Cold War posturing with the Soviets and Chinese and all kind of different folk. So Lyndon B. Johnson is forced to enact the Voting Rights Act of 1965. What happens is between citizenship and voting, that politically changes the American South to create the kind of Atlanta that could elect a Maynard Jackson. So this conversation around the black New South, what it also does is when that particular kind of legislation takes place, all of the black folk that had left the American South during the several great migrations and gone to Chicago, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, New York, all, Boston, all these different places, begin to realize that industry 
was extremely crippled in those areas and that there was an opportunity to come back south to land where most of their kith and kin were, where they had, where many of them owned land, and Atlanta becomes one of the right places based on the Sun Belt boom, a tech boom, where we see the movement of um, industrial jobs to more conversations around information sciences. And so this makes Atlanta right. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I'm going to play something for you. Many of you all have seen this before. Hopefully it works. It's coming. The International Olympic Committee has awarded the 1996 Olympic Games to the city of Atlanta. <laughs> There you have it. The announcement is in. Atlanta, Georgia will be the site of the 1996 Summer Olympics. What a tremendous moment going on right now at the Olympic uh, meeting there in Tokyo. And of course, here in Atlanta as well. There you can see Maynard Miller Jackson, uh, the former mayor, Andrew Young. Uh, just thrilled. Billy Payne has to be in tears at this moment. What a tremendous moment. Now, let's go quickly to underground Atlanta. So, I jumped very far because what I actually do is when you see this actual film, Maynard Jackson is mayor again. Maynard Jackson was mayor three times. But I did that to kind of set up what Ambassador Andrew Young did while he was in office. So, As early as 1975, the seeds were spawned for Atlanta to become an Olympic city. What happens is a handball player shows up in Maynard Jackson's office, uh, a handball player from the Munich Games, the 72 Munich Games, and he basically makes the statement, he says, I think Atlanta can host the Olympics. What Maynard Jackson does is he calls his friend J. Paul Austin. And J. Paul Austin brings together the 16 most prominent businessmen in Atlanta, and they vote a resounding no. Atlanta will not host the Olympics. And so what happens in this is what they were thinking about is that the 1972 Summer Games in Munich were marred where 11 Israeli athletes were murdered by a terrorist organization called Black September. And the 1976 Games in Montreal were marred by uh, debt. So the way in which we think about this, the games were impending at the time. But if you think about 2006, 30 years after um, Montreal had the games, you notice that the Montreal Expos moved to Washington to become the Washington Nationals because they signed a 30-year lease. So we've kind of seen that before, 20 years after Turner Field, and now there's a new stadium. So that's, a, that's this kind of conversation. So what happens in this is the 1980 games in Moscow were led by a U.S. boycott. What they saw was terror and debt were the issues, and so Atlanta doesn't get that bid, but Atlanta begins to pay attention because in 1978, there was only one city to bid for the Olympic Games, and that was Los Angeles. So Los Angeles bids for the 74 games in 19, the 84 games in 1978. The only other competition was Tehran, Iran, and you know that there was a lot of upheaval going on there at that point in time. So Los Angeles wins out, and what comes from this is this gentleman on the uh, left, Peter Uberoff, is able to organize 150 independent businesses to franchise Los Angeles for world consumption to, to gentrify Los Angeles to host the 84 Olympics. Atlantans are paying very close attention to this. And so what happens with this is in 1987, this gentleman on the right with his master's jacket on, Billy Payne, who is a former uh, attorney, linebacker for the Georgia Bulldogs, he had suffered a heart attack and needed to do some charity work, Approach, approaches Mayor Andrew Young about Atlanta hosting the Olympics. And initially when he interacts with Mayor Young, he thinks that Mayor Young is just kind of like, you know, what are you talking about? But what he doesn't know about Mayor Young is that 
Ralph Metcalf had trained him in track in New Orleans. Uh, as a child, his father had allowed him to go to the Orpheum Theater on Galvez Street in the city to see Jesse Owens beat the Nazis uh, in track. And so uh, um, Ambassador Young was also somewhat of an athlete, and so he really liked sports and whatever, whatnot. And it's when Billy Payne says, if you do this, this can help the children. And that really stuck with Mayor Young, whose wife was the chairwoman for the International Year of the Child. I was just outside uh, in, the, uh, in the area here, and I saw something uh, on one of the screens. If you get an opportunity, uh, the, the Gene Childs Young papers here are very rich. So if you're interested in some kind of research, that's really cool. And so what happens is as a result of this meeting, Young endorses Atlanta to try to see if it can serve as an Olympic city because this is a dress rehearsal for the Democratic National Convention in 1988. This is an opportunity to see what the city could do. And so what they do is they create the Georgia Amateur Athletic Foundation, where Atlanta played host of 40 different amateur sports. You also have the creation of a crazy Atlanta Nine. Um, it's, that's a pretty telling picture. And it was seen as once the Olympic movement was presented to Atlanta citizens, an Olympic machine was in full throttle. Thus. When Atlanta actually wins the bid in, in, on September 18, 1990, what happens in this is all of the Arab nations, all of the African nations, all of the Asian nations, South American nations, all vote for Atlanta to pay homage to Ambassador Young, who was mistreated because he interacted with the Palestinian Liberation Organization as UN ambassador. It is for that reason that Atlanta partially wins the Olympics, but there are some other conversations that take place here. So actually, I need to go back. Once Atlanta wins the bid for the Olympic Games, there is a movement that goes on that I call the Olympification of Atlanta. It involves several theoretical frameworks, urban regime theory, political economy, neoliberalism, racial uplift, culture of poverty. And what happens is Maynard Jackson runs as mayor again. Now, I can't prove this, but Michael Lomax actually jumped out there to run for mayor. And I don't know if there was a lot going on with the city in terms of what the politics would be. And I don't know if Maynard was forced to run because he knew where everything was, or if they just weren't ready for, I don't know if Michael Lomax was just holding it off. I can't quite prove that. But what happens in this is the way in which business was going on, Maynard made sure, as mayor, that he reestablished the affirmative action program and incorporated aspects of the EEOC and joint ventures to make sure that black contractors got some of this. What we also begin to see is the creation of the Atlantic Center and the Olympic Ring. So unbeknownst to most people, particular entities such as Coca-Cola, Delta Airlines, Bell South, drew an invisible line around the city, a ring around the city to take back all of the downtown real estate. You also have the Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau and the University System of Georgia that put about $160 million in creating Olympic Village, which became dorms for uh, Georgia State and then Georgia Institute of Technology. You also have the creation of the Atlanta Project. What this does is the Olympics become this catalyst to take back or to rid the city of Atlanta of black folk. And I can prove this several different kind of ways. The idea is that the motives of the white business elite play political politics with the black politicians. And what this do does is in decades leading up to 1990, you have about 70,000 people that were displaced, poor and homeless people. And they were sent to particular areas. You had federal support that was cut from the city by 74% leading up to this time. And so what we begin to see is how Ronald Reagan takes about 90% of all of the federal funds out of the city and it forces Ambassador Young to go international to get the world to invest. He actually goes to Africa, the Caribbean, and South America, the particular places that he was sent to promote American capitalism disguised as human rights to stave off the Soviets. And so what we have here is we are 30 years into a 40-year plan to take back downtown, and this is where we are. That is called the Beltline. Now, I want to share this with you all, too, just to give you a glimpse of something. 
1990, when Atlanta wins the bid for the Olympic Games, it was deemed as America's most criminally infested and violent city. There were 16,097 violent crimes that were committed. Uh, I can read you all the numbers, but that's not necessary. Over a 25-year period from 1980 to 2005, 1990 was the most violent year, and much of this had to do with crack cocaine. We'll get into this conversation in just a second. But this leads me to lean towards Miss Dorothy Bolden. Now, I'm going to tell you all something. I, I don't know uh, how many of you all knew um, Mrs. Dorothy Bolden. I did not get the opportunity to meet her, but I spent a lot of time with her in the archives, and I'm sh uh, her children have spent a lot of time with me. They found me, and we, we enjoy each other's company, and we're working on some different things going. But Dorothy Bolden was born in Madison, Georgia. Um, she grew up in Atlanta. She had problems with her eyes, but she had become really close to Norris Herndon, uh, the uh, president and CEO of the Atlanta Life Insurance, and he paid for several surgeries uh, on her eyes. And so, as a result, she becomes an activist, an educational activist, an activist for neighborhood planning and urban renewal and gentrification. But what she does that is what's most significant is she creates the National Domestic Workers Union. And what they do is they create uniform policies that protect the rights of domestic workers who are overwhelmingly black women. So uniform policies, benefits, uh, wage earnings, and all of these different things. She served as an advisor on several levels, local uh, city, local state, and national politics. It is said that every politician, when they would see her coming, they knew that fire and brimstone was coming. I'm going to show you all a clip that I took from this library. And uh, I don't know if any of y'all grew up with a black grandmother who did not want no back lip or would tell you his one time talk. But they're asking her a question about the Olympic Games. And I just want you to hear what she has to say. What were some of the issues that were, um, you were fighting against um, in today? Uh -huh. I'm fighting issues like imposing on people's as the referendum. Mm -hmm. I knew it wasn't going anywhere. I told them that it wasn't going anywhere. So what, what do you think is bad about the bond referendum? Well, they knew all that was there before they even thought about doing that. This is part of the money going to go to Olympic because, see, you knew when you went and got Olympic, you all wouldn't finance ABA. Your city wasn't in the condition to accept it. You got the narrowest streets that any city have in a state. You know that. And all that big blowing that Maynard Jackson said, thanking God, he better go back and search again and wonder did he thank the devil. Because trouble been in this thing ever since it's been coming this way. Mm -hmm. And you ain't seen the trouble yet. This God going to range, range down on them. Because, see, they're always plotting. They're plotting how they can get money. It's to put it over there and there. Now, it's going to take that much money to fix those bridges, but it's not going to take but a week to do it. That's stupid. Shouldn't take that much money. You had money before to fix it. You knew what was there. Everybody didn't come through this city and not pay a tax on anything and move on out somewhere else and work in here, bring the buses in here, and they don't pay nothing. But you're going to ride the poor man to death to pay this. And they're going to put a substance tax right here for the city of Atlanta and nowhere else. Are you kidding me? You've got to be sick. And you got no poor folks here? And who in the hell do you think going to take that and that land down? Nobody going to take that stuff laying down. And I should have gotten one because I, I was praying for God to make me better. So I'm much better. Mm -hmm. And I was finna roll up my sleeve. Baby, me and you going to have a boxing match out here on this thing. Mm -hmm. Because I wasn't nowhere in the world. I was going And tearing up all the communities going to make them what you want them to be? We not have any input. They ain't gone. Now, I'm showing this to you because this is a particular sentiment. This is a popular political sentiment of the black masses. Now, if you look in notes, you saw a lot of correspondence between Maynard Jackson and 
George Bowden. They actually had a very healthy relationship. But one of the things that Maynard Jackson would often say, and, and uh, Ambassador Young, too, would often say, is if you want something, your job as a citizen is to demand it of you. Dorothy Bowden did not back down when it came to this. And so she articulates a particular kind of political sentiment that runs counter to this idea of the black mecca. Now, I want, you, I want to stick a pin in that because I want to move here. This is Bunny Jackson Ransom. I call this, this, this picture Disco Bunny. And the reason I present this is when Bunny Jackson and Maynard divorced in 1976, Bunny, well, before they divorced, she founds a public relations firm called First Class Inc. And one of the things she's, she does is she works in terms of marketing for different businesses. But one day, she's approached by Donald Byrd, and Donald Byrd wants to see if she can get a music contract for um, this group that's locally here in Atlanta. And so Bunny, being a former first lady of the city, calls her friend Clarence Avant, who was the president of Taboo Records, and says, I got this group. I think that they sound good. And he says, well, why don't you record them and send me a demo? She was like, I don't have any money. So he wires her $200. She puts them in the studio. He likes them. He signs them. And they become the SOS Bank. And the reason I'm sharing this with you all is because as SOS moved up the scales coming from Atlanta, Larry Blackman from Cameo moves from New York to Atlanta. And Atlanta becomes this very interesting place when it came to the funk and disco sound. And what this does over a period of time is it sets the stage for organized noise. So this is where it gets interesting. You guys remember when I first started this presentation, I showed you a 17-year-old picture of me and I showed, showed you all this stuff with Outkast. When I was 17 and I heard the music, what I actually heard was the critique of the Olympification of Atlanta. And so what goes on here is I'm just going to let them tell it. When you ask them what was their influence, it was a blessing for one. But the, the actually dynamics of it was um, Sleepy Brown's father is Jimmy Brown from the group Brick. And that's, a, um, and that's a 70s funk band that was a part of like, you know, so he grew up on the side of stages. Like as a kid, most of the time if he saw music performed, it was through, through live music. The SOS band, Cameo, like different shows that he would be at. So in his, what he thought of music was making it live. Now my partner, Amir Ray Murray over here, he um, was like such a hip hop scholar as far as like um, studied hip hop before hip hop was necessarily popular here in Atlanta, Georgia. And back when the Beat Street, the breaking, and from, the, and from African Bambada, just so all the history of it. So I feel like organized noise sound is based on that. It's based on our love of hip hop and our um, thirst of live music. So I think together we end up coming up with our sound, and which just so happened to be Outkast's first album, Southern Playlist of Cadillac Music. So that's the horse's mouth right there, but I want to kind of put this in context. Outkast on the left, their first album dropped Southern Playlist of Cadillac Music in April of 1994. They had a Christmas single uh, in 1993. We get into that, it comprises of Andre Benjamin and um, Antoine Patton. Uh, uh, Antoine Patton's birthday is tomorrow, I'm just thinking as I'm talking about it. And then you got Goody Mob, who uh, both of them come from uh, Southwest Atlanta, uh, that comprises of Willie Knighton, Robert Barnett, Cameron Gibb, and Thomas Calloway. And when this music comes out of Atlanta, what it does is it critiques Atlanta and the Olympics. Now, let me put this in full context. One of the things that Maynard Jackson understood as mayor is that with a political movement, you always had an expressive arm. So Maynard Jackson creates the Bureau of Cultural Affairs that was created to foster expressive art. And because Atlanta was a black city, 67% black, it primarily fostered black art. And so this is how the Atlanta Jazz Festival was created. They created grants and all kind of uh, funding opportunities for local artists to express themselves. What Organized Noise does is they take the soul and funk that comes out of um, Atlanta, they put rap music over it, and they critique this idea of Atlanta moving into being a, an international city. So I'm going to 
give you an example of this. This is a picture of Wesley Merritt. If you look at the picture, I, we don't have a lot of time to do a lot of this, so if you look at the picture, um, you see a dapper gentleman uh, who has a coat over his arms. He's walking up some steps. And I, I, I hate to do this, but when I ask my students, they're like, what does it look like? It's like, it looks like he's going to jail. And I'm like, bingo. Wesley Merritt was the number one number runner in all of Georgia. Um, he was born in, in Social Circle, Georgia. He comes to Atlanta. Um, he ran a racket called the Bug to where um, you would pay, you know, so much into, you know, a pot. And if you hit the numbers, which just so happens to be the, the numbers of the stock market, the last few numbers of the stock market, you, if you put $5 in, you get $2,500 back. Now, let me tell you how I came across this. This is bloodhound work. Um, in 2007, I had gone to Australia to do a comparative study of Sydney and Melbourne's Olympics and Atlanta's Olympics. And there was a, uh, an archivist here by the name of Janice White Sykes Rogers. And Ms. Rogers had asked me to bring her a book on Aboriginal folklore. So I was doing dissertation research, and I walk up here with this book after spending 23 hours on an airplane. And I give it to her, and there's this older gentleman sitting in the archives upstairs. And you guys may not know this, but when you study history and they think you're young, they'd be like, you don't know what you're talking about, boy. I lived it. You know, it's, it's always this kind of issue. And um, so there was this older gentleman who was, um, he used to like, well, I was the first black person to work at the CDC. I was like, oh, okay, you know, cool. I was raised right, so I know how to act. And he said, but that was just my day job. He said, like, it kept my benefits. He says, but I was actually a top-earning lieutenant for Wesley Mer Merritt. And I was so good that I went to the Players Bar for 25 years straight at the Ponciana Hotel. And I said, what? So what I was able to do is to get the primary source to talk about this Players Bar. Now, I want to play something for you. I want you to hear what, I want you to listen to the musicality. Man, the scene was so thick. Low rise, 77 Sevilles, L dog, Nem but them lax. All the players, all the hustlers. I'm talking about a black man in heaven here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's Christmas bells. I'll tell y'all an interesting story about this. Players ball is just one example. A true inspiration, contrary to, uh, there was a journalist by the name of Ronnie Sarik that basically said that this was a kind of spinoff on Hustlers Convention and, and, and lightning rods kind of stuff. And yeah, that might be true on a very low level. But what's going on here is that Wesley Merritt ran the illegal lottery in Atlanta known as the Bug and credited it as the most lucrative illegal gambling operation in the Southeast. He originally hailed from, from, from Social Circle, Georgia, from humble beginnings, but took up residence in the Summer Hill community on Atlanta's south side. Though he owned lucrative illegal businesses, he dressed in neatly pressed bib overalls with nice shoes and clothes not common from the stereotypical showy hustler. At every chance, he invested his proceeds in illegal ventures such as real estate, nightclubs, pool halls, and a motel. He did numerous stints in jail for his illegal activity, but he remained in the good graces of the police and politicians, thanks to, thanks to their payoffs skimmed from the bug. For example, during one of Merritt's prison stints, former Atlanta City Councilman Q.V. Williamson Real Estate real Estate's company handled his gambling property holding, and the Atlanta politician occasionally released Merritt from jail so that he could go and conduct his personal business. In 1971, Williamson used his authority to sign out Merritt in jail. What I'm, able to, what I'm telling you is I'm able to find this documentation that speaks to this. Um, Wesley Merritt was killed in 1995 by some corner boys, and he had $9,700 in cash on him. At his funeral, he was eulogized as a good and passionate man. Over a 1,000 agreed at shouts and amens and hallelujah. Perhaps the best assessment of Merritt's contribution to Atlanta's working class and poor communities was the statement that Deacon Clarence Mitchell, who asserted that Merritt was a jack em up business, a jack like one you put under the car when you get a flat tire to jack it up 
which is what Wesley Merritt did for the poor community. I'm going to share something with you. One of Wesley Merritt's closest friends was a guy that he called Buck Bennett. We know him as Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. When Dr. Mays needed money for young men to go to Morehouse, he would send a note to Wesley Merritt. Wesley Merritt would put $10,000 in a number two paper bag. He would pay tuition. And what this suggests is that even the hustlers had a real affinity for taking care of the black community. See, someone like Wesley Merritt took care of the sick. He fed the poor. He buried the dead. So it complicates this narrative on what we think is legal and illegal. It, it humanizes this. Give y'all another example of this. This particular, uh, so there is some cursing in this. Um, we're adults in here. Now, I'm not promoting any cursing or whatever, whatnot. But this particular song right here actually um, changed my life. It made me really begin to kind of think about some things. So. So keep your eyes peeled for the Cobra unit cause they know for jumping out of black Chevy choice and through the ball. Here comes the red dogs. I'm busting out around the corner in my hall. Dipping from the area, I'm scared. So one of these bitches might wind up dead. Cause I have no time for jail. Fuck clapping cops. Fuck Elgin Bell. Hey, crooked ass Jackson. Got the whole country thinking that my city is the big lick for 96. Now that's pretty implicit. It's, you, you can see exactly what it is. But Cameron Gibbs' account clearly detailed the drug trafficking that was still a very uh, prevalent in the city of Atlanta as it went through the Olympification process. Gibbs voiced fears of undercover Cobra units and the Red Dog Police, whose primary purpose was to purge Atlanta's street of drugs, black vagrants, and other black undesirables. The excessive force used by City Hall and forces influenced Gibbs' description. Unlike their parents' generation, which adored black politicians such as Jackson, Atlanta's black youth in the 1990s rebuked not only Maynard Crooked Ass Jackson, but also Police Chief Eldrin Bell, President Bill Clampett Clinton, and Mayor Bill Clampett Campbell. This is what's going on here. So we'll talk about the Red Dogs in just a second. But what they explicitly do is this particular generation critiques and calls out a group of folk that had actually been admired by our parents' generation. It shows that there is a different kind of political sentiment from, from the youth. Um, one of the times I presented this, and uh, Cameron Gilt was in the audience, and he was, uh, and the night before he had taken, you know, I wish Major Jackson was here, I'd tell him how great he was. And so it just shows you how, how we begin to kind of understand this thought process in terms of political maturation. But it explicitly puts it out here. And Crooked Jackson got the whole country thinking that my city is the big league for 96. I want to make reference to Clampett Cops. Um, well, well, we'll get into that in just a second. Here's another one. They got some new sweets down P Street. Left wing for the feds, right wing for the hard heads. Make them all deals and buddy folks made with hearts fear. Somebody don't want my face in this place for 96 shit slick. Call me clean looking fresh. Start be scratching at my chest under the order who, guess who, ain't none iller. The middle one to one to your ass. No more life, what you gave is the past. Cause ain't no future. One the miller kept your case. Disgrace your face, make it seem to be safe. Ain't no place to run, run, run. So. They got some new suites down Peachtree. The first thing built on time and under budget after the Atlanta wins the Olympic Games is a thousand bed jail. Fifty-six million dollars. The left for the feds for federal offense offenders, right for the hard headers, the local offenders. And what goes on here is this thousand bed jail built at 254 Peachtree Street was built to house the homeless and poor during the games. Gip also hints to the corruption, hints to the corruption that later resulted during a federal investigation of bribery that occurred in securing Atlanta's Centennial Olympic bid. For example, the scandal during the November 1993 mayoral, mayoral runoff election for a federal investigation on concession services that was suspected of giving millions in bribes and shares to city officials in return for lower rent and favorable legislation. The investigation led to the indictment of seven people, including airport businessman Harold Eccles, who pled guilty, um, having bribed two city council members, Ira Jackson and Douglas Buddy Fouts. The investigation tarnished the reputation of Atlanta's affirmative action program, which was the model for the nation. 
Of the seven who faced charges, former airport commissioner and councilman Ira Jackson was found guilty on 83 counts of mail fraud, 43 counts of accepting bribes, and four counts of tax evasion, along with illegally receiving more than $1 million in addition to bribes. Now, I'm sharing this because there's something else going on here. So it says, got me looking fresh, got dogs scratching at my chest, talking about the red dogs again. It says, there's none iller than Miller. This presents a particular piece because in 1994, Bill Clinton passes a federal three strikes rule. If you have two federal offenses, your third is automatic 25 years to life in prison. There are a lot of politicians that sit today that cut their teeth, their political careers, on incarcerating black men. This increased federal prison populations of black men by 800%. Well, to not be outdone, Zell Miller here in the state of Georgia passed a two-strike state rule, which increased state prisons by 1,300% overwhelmingly black men. And so when we begin to talk about this, what we're talking about is the prison industrial complex. This is a way of doing away with undesirables. This is going to be the last one for tonight so that we can kind of get into some discussion and signings and all this kind of stuff. Thought process again. Think that in reality the world is like a ball full of players. We trapped off in this maze with walls made up like it's an only prayer. It's the tightest game that you can have. The devil's taking a swing that might just bring the broken glass. But my crystal ball sent the pistol fall to the wayside. Nobody would die in cops and robbers when we used to play right. Huh. Only thing we fit was William Swain. Now, now, that is a direct reference to the Atlanta child murders. I spend a lot of time on the Atlanta child murders, and I'm going to tell you something. I told you all that my father was offered a job when I was a child at the Atlanta University Center. The reason I didn't grow up here is because my father said they will not kill my children. I grew up in Alabama because he felt like he had more control. Um, I, uh, I, I've, this is known, but I'm going to announce it. I have a new podcast starting with NPR called Snatched. I interviewed seven missing and murdered mothers for this book. I interviewed siblings. I interviewed Wayne Williams himself. Some of the things I couldn't use in the book because of the, the clearance for uh, the IRB uh, Institutional Review Board in prison is something very clear. But this is a very eye-opening kind of experience. What happens is all evidence suggests that the murders took place for 10 years. There are more than 275 victims takes place from 75 to 85, but it's swept under the rug because as early as 75, Atlanta is working to get the Olympics, and the hunting and killing of black children is a black eye on the city's image. And so there is a lot that goes on with this. So I'm going to read something to you. With Williams' guilty verdict, the Atlanta police disbanded, and the police task force garnered a negative outburst from members of the Atlanta's black communities who contested the verdict. See, no one believed that Wayne Williams actually, no one in the black community believed that Wayne Williams had actually committed the murder, com the murders. There's a lot that goes on with that. Many remain convinced that the murders had not been solved. Camille Bell, mother of Yusuf Bell, exclaimed, Judge Cooper was a part of the prosecution. Joseph Lowry stated, I don't think you will find anyone in Atlanta's black communities who believe Wayne Williams committed all those murders alone. We feel there should be some continuing cooperative effort with the federal agencies. Reverend Joseph Boone, director of the Metropolitan Atlanta Summit Leadership Congress, openly attacked the closing of the books on the two murders and explained that many mothers in, in black areas of the city were still afraid that a killer was still on the loose. Again, there was a growing suspicion among those preyed upon by the serial killers that the jury had found the wrong man guilty. Or better yet, there was not enough evidence to convict Williams of all of the crimes. Great unease remained in Atlanta's black communities. I went to some extent to quote one of the mothers, and this is what she said. Wayne Williams ain't killed them children. The Klan ain't killed them kids. This has to do with interferon. Interferon was used to cause cancer. It cured more cancer in so-called Caucasians. 30 years ago, black males were not dying every time you looked around from cancer. The most potent form of interferon is found in a black male child that had never had a full sexual experience. That's the most potent form of it. I'm not saying that I believe this mother, but let me tell you what I am saying, is that most people in the black community 
did not feel at ease that justice had been served. Even today, when if, if, if a child is walking down the street and they end up dead, everyone in the city becomes terrified, particularly if you're of a particular age, becomes terrified and said, is the Atlanta child murderer attacking again? I just wanted to give you all kind of a brief overlook of the book. There's a lot in it. Uh, if you do decide to purchase the book, if you read the chapter on the Atlanta child murders, I suggest you read it with the appendix because it is the actual only distillation of all of the known murders and what their hustles were. So the black community deemed these children as hustlers and runaways. We actually go through all of the archival records. We go through all of the FBI papers. We go through everything to show that, by and large, most of the young people murdered were just regular kids running errands, trying to make a little money to go and play video games and go and watch movies. I hope that you've enjoyed uh, this brief conversation that we've had tonight, and I look forward to talking with you guys. So with that being said, thank you. So I don't know what the format is, but um, you got, if, this, if you have questions, I'm more than willing to answer. That's what I think. You running the show. I, I did have a conversation with Eldrin Bell about it, and I, it is funny, I had to catch him. Uh, I was at a car dealership one day, we were sitting there together, and I was like, now is the best time as I could possibly do this, because, you know, it's, it's difficult to get people. Um, so I began to talk to him about it. My, my, my son was probably a year old, and I had a baby with me, and we were in the car dealership. And I say, so, you know, uh, you know, I understand that you were very close to Rico Wade, and uh, that you had actually, because they had been kicked out of the apartment because they were making so much noise, that you actually provided them the, 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 the house with the, uh, the dungeon basement on Lakewood Terrace. And he was like, yeah, man. I said, so what did you think when, uh, when, when they said, you know, F Camp Clampett Cops, F Eldon Bell? He said, well, to be honest with you, I didn't, really, um, I didn't really hear it, but everybody was calling me from around the world saying, that, man, they're cussing you out on this, 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 this album. And so in talking to Rico Wade, Rico was like, I had to pull Gip to the side and say, hey, man, you got to change that because, you know, Eldon Bell was the one who gave us the house that we've been, you know, doing all this recording in. So it was one of those things to where um, because uh, Bell, Commissioner Bell, now Commissioner Bell, because he was so close to Rico Wade's family, he, he, he let it slide. I mean, he was just kind of like, you know, it's, it's, it's some youth, some young kids kind of doing their thing. But it's a very, very, very interesting story on how the irony of that works. Yes, in the back.
I recently saw something in the West End where a bungalow went for three hundred fifty or four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Four hundred fifty thousand dollars. We have the establishment of a new stadium when the old stadium could have just been revamped. But hey, whatever. Um, you have the refurbishing of a new basketball arena. You have Georgia State that has given the onus of breathing life back into downtown. Let me tell you all something. This urban renewal and gentrification. If you watch, um, if you watch, uh, what's the uh, my wife watches House Hunters and um, all of that stuff. That's gentrification 101. Like we've gotten into a culture where this thing becomes chic, and urban renewal and gentrification is going to take place. The thing is, is you have to outrun it, and that's very difficult to do. And so we're seeing all kinds of aspects of black communities that have been demolished. Um, even down the street where the, the interstate runs through Auburn Avenue and the displacement of all the people in the 1960s, this has been a plan that has taken place for a long time to reverse white flight. So you have a city that goes from 67% black to now being just over 50%. And that creates the kind of political tenor as to what we saw in the last mayoral election. So yeah, I see a lot of I see a lot of things taking place that kind of speak to that, uh, to those parallels in terms of franchising the city for, for world consumption. There's someone back here. In, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
there is no respect for the preservation of the history and culture of church history. I don't know if you all know this, but history, there's a debate in the church history. Is it a history of Jesus Christ or is it a history of the church by Jesus Christ? But last year around this time, we had professors were giving uh, conversations Then the Federal Government took the Jewish faith, right, that ministry, and they had it. And then in order to give true homage to what John Wesley Giles was doing in front of the Sweet Arbor, then they build a bus for John Wesley Giles, and if you look down Sweet Arbor, all you see is the entrance. That's disrespectful. And by nature, public history is created to be inclusive and understand the 